and thank you for joining me today on Leaving Babylon. I'm Madeline. Today is the part three of the Sides of the North series and it's called Times and Seasons. Something that our community of believers have realized is that we are not on the timeline that we've been told and even things like our calendar for example the way that that's been set up have been changed intentionally by design and the reason for this design is deception. We read in Daniel 7, 25, the words that say, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, until a time, uh, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of a time. So one thing we know that the enemy does is change times and seasons, actually, and, and change the way that we understand the context in which we're living in relationship to uh, the, um, the world around us and our understanding of where are we in history and what are we actually, uh, where are we and who are we? And that's, that's really the, the questions that lead us to understand things like the biblical cosmology, so many of us now are in um, are kind of in this this time frame after realizing biblical cosmology, and that's one of the things that it all goes together. So you have biblical cosmology, which some people coming into it for the first time might recognize as flat Earth. We recognize it as a um, the 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 structure of the realm in which we live, not just the land itself but uh, the sky above us or the firmament above us and the heavenly bodies within the, that firmament and what that means and it also affects things like understanding this also affects things like our understanding of directions and seasons so we have the stars and the moon and the sun and God gave those to us in uh, as we read in Genesis for the um, so that we would know the times and the seasons and so that we could uh, really be fruitful on the earth actually so the, these are the the ways that God equipped us to be fruitful in in this beautiful realm in which he created us and uh, so that's those are kind of the themes that I want to talk about today but specifically about the north and the north is very pivotal because once you do realize uh, the biblical cosmology you realize that the reason they have created these false understandings of things like space and you know swirling balls of gas which represent so-called stars and planets and things like this is to truly hide the position that we hold on this earth which is beneath our creator who sits on top of the earth or on top of the firmament and he said um, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool you know these are the positions that um, define who we are to God and who God is to us and how he cares for us. He created this realm uh, so that we could worship him and that we could glorify him by being fruitful on this earth. And so he's given us all the tools for that. And the, the, the thing that the enemy does is try to change it all so that we would be uh, corrupted in our understanding of what we're doing here. So some of the um, things I want to talk about today are going to be related to um, the, the the positions, so uh, directional positions. I'm going to talk about the moon. I'm going to talk about something that I want to call the East Gate, uh, which is really um, defined throughout the Bible. Um, this picture that I'm showing here is kind of that theme of the cherubim standing at the East Gate protecting the garden when God uh, turned Adam and Eve out of the garden, he put a cherubim at the gate of the garden so that sin would no longer enter. And I believe that that is still the same kind of, um, you know, that hit, everything God does is with purpose and it has meaning to it. And so the when we see the, the temple, the building of the temple, the east gate was the gate through which uh, you would come into the temple of God and I believe it's all connected uh, we have a lot to to base that on throughout scripture so one thing I think we'll start with talking about is actually um, and and so here would be an example of kind of what we're 
what we're visualizing a little bit around the biblical cosmology where God lives at the north, um, above the north. God is in heaven, but the New Jerusalem would have, you know, would come down and be central to everything because that is um, how God describes things, you know, and even the, the verse that talks about the sides of the north in Psalms, um, you know, these positions are very important to us understanding where we are in relationship to our king, which is Jesus. Uh, the root of Jesse sits on the throne of David forever and ever, and so we, we need to know where we are in position to our king. And, you know, all of creation is filled with the glory of God. So there is nothing that we don't see around us that doesn't point to our Creator and to God who loves us and who cares for us and wants us to know that He is here with us, even in this time of deception. And so the eschatology around this, or the end times um, understanding around this, is that we have been fed uh, an enormous amount of lies. And when I say we, I mean the Christian Church, the modern Christian Church, specifically the Church of the West has been fed a doctrine of um, dispensationalism, which is rooted in a futurist, uh, in other words, that Jesus hasn't come yet, and that he hasn't established his kingdom on earth yet, which is very strange because he very much said throughout all of his ministry here on earth that he was going to come quickly and he was going to, he was going to the people he was talking to in those um, scenarios he was going to uh, return before they even died. And these are very specific references. And so I believe that he did come, just as he said. I believe he established his kingdom. And uh, so all of that has happened. And where we find ourselves now is at the end of Revelation, which is we are um, now in a time of great deception. So if you look at Revelation chapter 20, verse 7 to 8, you'll see on a timeline in terms of the end times where we're positioned and that would be during the what's called the little season and so Satan is is let loose from his bot from the bottomless pit where he was for a thousand years while Jesus was reigning and ruling on earth and he was set loose and we are now in that time period where he is set loose to deceive the whole world so we see it all around us and as, as a person starts to realize things like biblical cosmology and a lot of other things that are going on, uh, which I won't go into detail about, but those are the things that give us the realization that we genuinely are in the time of great deception and I have absolutely no doubt about that. So um, today I want to talk a little, start talking a little bit about the moon. Um, because the moon actually plays a part in the Great Deception. Not only do they say that we landed on the moon and all of these kinds of things, but they uh, and, and then they fabricate these things very, very extremely to to um, and, and you know over the past I don't know was it in the 60s? So that would be like 50, 60 years ago now um, that they actually went between 50 and 60 years ago. Uh, that they so-called went to the moon and landed on the moon and they continue to perpetuate this ridiculous nonsense to us um, because there are many that are still just believing what they see you know without really waking up and thinking it through um, so we're going to talk about the moon a little bit not in terms of the, the moon landing or anything like that but more in terms of biblical cosmology and what is the moon for also um, part of the corruption of our timeline has involved the moon so the moon and, and our understanding of the moon has actually been corrupted. So one thing I want to show you is this, uh, the, the principles of the new moon. A lot of the feasts, well, all of the feasts in the Old Testament and even the Sabbath, okay, were based on a moon or a lunar cycle. And if you study the moon at all, you'll realize that there's a very regular predictable pattern as this as there is actually with the sun and the stars as well but the moon is something that was uh, given to us to define the month which is called you know which if you think about it moon month month a month is defined by the moon but what the uh, the people who've set up society in the way they have in the current way that it's you know constructed 
is that our calendars actually work on a solar calendar, meaning they follow the, the sun, the movement of the sun, which is a corruption, which is why we have some months that have 28 days and then sometimes 29 and then we have some months that have 30 days and other months that have or months that have 31 days so it, it's a whole mixed bag but if you look at the phases of the moon you'll realize that the moon phases are uh, very steady there's the moon doesn't actually change in its cycle and it has a very clear predictable pattern of illumination and the Bible relies a lot on the moon cycle to to present what it wants to what God wants to um, to give us so so the the feasts were often based around the moon and they were often based around actually the new moon so um, one of the principles I want to challenge today is the actual new moon is the full moon and this is one of the things, this is one of the corruptions that has happened. Um, God gave us the sun to rule the day and the new moon, or the moon, sorry, to rule the night. How do you rule the night if you are in complete darkness? So when God talks about the moon in terms of a new moon, it is actually biblical to realize this as a full moon. And I, I want to share this around because I think a lot of people are very confused about the moon and, and how it actually lines up in our current calendar uh, to, to guide things like people who want to observe Sabbath. Well, when is Sabbath? Believe it or not, if you're following a true moon calendar, the Sabbath is not on Saturday every month. <laughs> Maybe some months it will be. But Sabbath is Sabbath start, so the full moon is a is a day, so it's called full moon day. The day after that is day one of your new month. Okay, so you have full moon day, and then you have day one of your new month. And it looks like this. So your new month would actually this year, the New Year's Day, was on April 24th, okay? Because the new moon this year was on April 23rd. So you have April 23rd and then your first day of the year and in this case of, of the month as well is, uh, was actually April 24th. So the Sabbath is the seventh day, you see. So day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven, and then your Sabbath day. So it counts after, seven days after your first day. And so in the current calendar, because we're using a solar calendar, the first uh, Sabbath day in April was actually um, May 1st, okay? And that was a Wednesday. So these are the, and I'm just, I'm going through this now because I, I really want people to understand that the month is based on the moon, not the sun. And so when you start shifting into understanding that your, your new month starts when the moon is completely visible. And these are some of, the, I won't read these all out, but there is scripture to back up what the full moon, uh, where the full moon is actually um, reflected, um, ironically, in the scriptures. And so, you know, things like it being visible at a certain time of the year and and these sorts of things so you know the brilliance of the moon and again just to say like how do you see the face of the moon if you if you can't see the moon you see and um, our God is the father of lights and and there is no shadow and the whole the whole understanding as well is when we look at things like um, Easter which was actually uh, Pasha in, and Passover in the Hebrew context. Um, the, the full moon was there to light their way, you see. So all of these, and it was the vernal equinox, and you know, this, this, is, this is actually all incorporated, and we're going to look at this a little bit more as I, as I keep talking. I hope I'm explaining it well. I'm trying to be coherent. So 
the reason why Easter, even though that is a pagan holiday and the, the pagans have taken over all the symbology and taken over all the uh, forms of worship and, and kind of the way that it's celebrated, is because of the equinox. The vernal equinox and the full moon that follows the vernal equinox lands on the same approximate date because as the Jewish Passover and this keeps everything lined up but the pagans also observe this same date so when we say don't you know celebrate Easter that is actually very good advice don't celebrate Easter but it is at the same time it, it wasn't this past year interestingly enough uh, but so this past year we had 13 months and that's the other thing about the the Hebrew calendar is there is there would be an extra 13th month um, within that that cycle so the 13th month was a whole month after the Easter this year I recommend everyone looking into this getting on the right lunar calendar is I believe a way that we will come back into understanding the creation around us and we will come back into really realizing that uh, we are part of a much bigger picture and as God's creations we are here to understand our environment and so this this just describes a little bit of the way that Rome held on to the same date because they were following a similar pattern in terms of the equinoxes and and here we see uh, that you know Passover actually so every instance of the the new lunar month um, mentioned in scripture the following day was the seventh day this the Sabbath so this website I I don't highly recommend it because I, I get very confused why they don't follow biblical cosmology and that's just one of the things they don't seem to grasp at this point and they also use a lot of the Hebraic terms and as a New Testament Christian, as a New Covenant Christian, I don't ascribe to that. Uh, but if you do want to check out, I do, I've gone through the research on this and I feel very strongly that it's accurate around the moon being the full moon, the new moon being the full moon. And therefore we know when the Sabbath is and we know that we know when things like Passover actually take place. They do have some good printable calendars and so if you find their website it's called thecreatorscalendar.com again just you know have some discernment around their uh, cosmology because they're not quite there yet but I do I do appreciate the work that they've done so one of the other things that I came across was the way that uh, Tolkien dealt with the moon and opening the gate in Moriah the gate but it was actually called the West Gate. So I don't know if this is a bit of an inversion and and that kind of thing, but I will play a video just now to show what that scene is all about. Dwarf doors are invisible when closed. Yes, Gimli, there are masters cannot find them if their secrets are forgotten. Why doesn't that surprise me? Suppose that? Oh, it's quite simple. If you want a friend, you speak the password and the doors will open. Spell in all the tongues of elves, men and 
Orcsi. What are you going to do then? Knock your head against these doors, Peregrine Took, and if that does not shatter them, and I am allowed a little peace from foolish questions, I will try to find the opening words. Mines are no place for a body. Even one so brave as. It's a riddle. Speak, friend, and enter. What's the Elvish word for friend? Bell. Something that you'll have noticed in that is when the sun, or sorry, when the moon shone on the location of the doorway uh, or the gate into Mariah, it uh, lit up. Something else I noticed was the sort of Masonic symbolism, but it also actually symbolizes the creation aspect of the realm that we're in. And my belief is that as they hide these understandings, these sort of, you know, uh, I don't know what, I don't know what word I'm looking for, but as they hide these understandings of the cosmology within things like movies and books and storylines, they're telling us that they know what we don't know, you see. And so here's just a description of, of this Mariah Gate, so Mariah, uh, the West Gate. So God's temple actually is built uh, to let you in by the East Gate. And so we talked a little bit about the East Gate already. And just one thing I should read before we go into that is when Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So to be careful with the information here, I just want to say that going in the West Gate is, is not what we're talking about, but rather how they've used the moon to guide this kind of process and so here's a picture of the moon setting westward about an hour or two before sunrise in I don't know where that is uh, but this stellarium using the moonlight and so some of this is uh, I'm not going to read all of this but it kind of talks through how these people generally understand that the moon is a timing machine. It's a time machine, a time clock, as are the stars, uh, which sort of tell us what seasons we're in. And then the moon would tell us what time of year we're in. So we have the moon and the season, uh, but the months and the seasons, uh, where in the year we're at. So that's, that's the difference between them. But again, the moon can't rule the night unless you're actually, you can actually see it. And God gave it to us to rule the night. I was really pleasantly interested to find out that John Bunyan, who also wrote The Pilgrim's Progress and also wrote a, another book that we saw last time, and we'll look at it a little again this time, he wrote a, a book called The Straight Gate. And something I want to highlight here is here on page 9. Uh, so we have a description of the straight, straight gate and he says that by a, a double similitude, so it's got, called a gate, a straight gate, and those who strive to enter in at the straight gate. And I'll just read this here. It is set forth by the similitude of a gate. A gate, you know, is of double use. It is to open and shut and so consequently to let in or to keep out. And to do both these, the season uh, is, is, sorry, the season, as he said, let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened till the sun be set hot. And again, I command that the gates should not shut and 
charged that they should not be opened till after the Sabbath. Nehemiah 7, 3. Um, and then again, 13, 19, and 20. And so you find this gate of heaven when the five wise virgins came to the gates were opened, but after they came other virgins and the door was shut. And then it says here, uh, so then the entrance into heaven is called a gate to show that there is a time when there may be an entrance and there will come a time when there shall be none. And indeed, this is the chief truth contained in the text. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter and shall not be able. I find this really interesting because on one hand, you know, we're told that the gate is a spiritual thing only. And what I read in scripture tells me that there are more ways to understand what God's telling us than just purely script, uh, spiritual, right? Um, our spirit and our body are to enter the kingdom because, you know, I think we see all of this relevant throughout scripture. We see there's this overlap of the spiritual and the physical. There's this kind of um, connection. And so I my ponderings are that it is not purely spiritual however your spirit has to also be able to enter and i think that's the difference and i think you know whether we can enter physically um or not is up to god but spiritually we we know that this to be true there is a biblical cosmology around us which has been hidden why would it be hidden is it partly hidden so that we don't know where our home is and we are wandering in the wilderness outside the gates of the the city of god and or the camp of the saints and so the timing on that part you know whether it's whether it's the new jerusalem or whether it's the camp of the saints you know um it could be kind of a combined picture where the new jerusalem and the camp of the saints also you know exist together in a similar fashion so uh, and are accessible um, by by God's design uh, once we qualify for certain um, certain access, right? And obviously Jesus Christ is the the gate, um, and so spiritually he he is there to verify us as a witness to our salvation through him and through his blood. So when we're covered by the blood of Jesus, he will allow us into the kingdom, into into his presence. And yet he tells us to seek the gate, you know. And I find it very interesting in Matthew how the, the verses follow each other. You know, it's like, ask and you shall be, you know, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be opened unto you. So these are very literal expressions. I found Jesus to be, as I read more and more, very literal, in, even just in the way that he said he was coming quickly. And, and so let's read a little bit more here. Um, page 10 Jesus is the door and only those saved by faith in his finished work of salvation can enter so the gate to heaven is, is what Jacob saw in Bethel and so Bethel was the house of God I'm just trying to find where I'm reading here do, do, do. might be on the next page here Here we go. So starting here, Bethel was the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. That is the entrance, for he saw the entrance into heaven. One end of Jacob's ladder stands in Bethel, God's house, and the other end reacheth up to the gate of heaven. Genesis 28, so that's 10, 11, 12, 13, uh, 14, 15, 16, 17. Jacob's ladder was the figure of Christ. This is what the, the writer is saying, which ladder was not the gate of heaven, but the way from the church to that gate, which he saw above at the top of the ladder. And 
in one of my previous videos in this series, I talked about, and it's called um, Portal Priests and, okay, I can't remember the full name of it, but it's part two in this series. And um, so it talked about, I talked about the ladder of, ladder of divine ascent. So the ladder of divine ascent is depicted all throughout ancient history, medieval history actually. And it shows people coming up the ladder and Jesus literally being the gate. He is there and he is bringing people in through a portal. So the gate being the door, that is Jesus, right? There's no question about that. But the way that we, we interpret scripture, I think could be a little bit more literal. Don't take my word on it, but I do think that that could actually hold some, um, some valid, uh, valid truth in it. Let's talk about the East. East is a direction that often we think about in terms of uh, our relationship to it. However, I think it's more appropriate to think about the East as somewhere that is a, a set location. And the reason I say that is because the East is discussed as a very central theme in the Bible right from the beginning as we've seen the East Gate was you know protected as a central point of entry into the garden and I think it's also relevant around uh, the birth of Jesus the location of the true uh, land in the Bible and I don't, and in one of my previous videos uh, called The River, and it, I discussed the Jordan and where was the Jordan. And I, I kind of gonna come back to talking about that now. And so when we talk about the North and the East, these are physical locations. These are like set uh, quadrants, if you will, that exist on the realm, on the earth. And so the North is a, is a set location the east is a set location, the west is a set location, as is the south. And I'll be bringing up some maps a little bit later in this video to demonstrate where those likely are. And initially I just want to look at uh, Matthew here. So Matthew chapter 2, we hear that the wise men came from the east. So the east, if we just don't think about that in terms of the direction they came from, but the location they they lived in so the east is somewhere that they lived so they came from the east yes but the east is a location so it's like i saying i came from new york or i came from vancouver these are these are locations okay and uh so on the realm we have quadrants we have quarters of the earth and they're they're separated into four uh north south east west right everybody knows this so when you say I came from the east, it means I came from a, a, a location. It doesn't mean I came from the east, okay? Now, uh, I want to just look at wise men really quickly. And we'll come back to who these wise men actually were. The wise men are called Megos. And they are actually Babylonian, Chaldean... Medes, Persians, and, and this kind of thing. And the reason I bring this up is because these people were were actually magicians in terms of they were doing sorcery. And they were reading the patterns of the sky, they understood it very well. And they, they were able to predict certain events that were happening. So it, it does kind of follow that when Jesus was born, they knew that he was being born and that he was going to usher in a new kingdom. So they saw him as a, a, royal, a royal person. Whether they knew exactly who he was or not, I know that they conferred with Herod following that and just basically, you know, not getting Jesus into trouble with Herod, but they left and, and they went back to their land. So the the understanding here is that these men were Babylonian Chaldeans and in my mind these people are not actually great people okay they're not you know we often depict them as being these like lovers of God and Jesus and yes they honored him and they they noted who he was and in 
you know, the way I kind of see it now as I'm older is they were almost saying, we see you, we know you're here, we are tracking you, <laughs> and uh, we can find you, we found you where you were born, you know, this kind of thing. So it's kind of an interesting uh, mention in the Bible that they get, but it's obviously significant because it also means that the stars heralded, the one star heralded where Jesus was located. And I think that's important to recognize. The Magi were a group of people that adhered basically to Zoroastrianism. Here it says the only recorded designation of all priests of priests of all Western Iranians during the Median, Archimenid, Parthian, and Sassanian periods. And so these people kind of bore a title of, of priest, actually, so the chief Magi or Magi. The word Magus is attested in Old Persian, Elamite, Akkadian, Aramaic, Parthian, and Sasanian documents, as well as in texts of classical antiquity. Its earliest mention is in Bysotun, inscription of Darius I the Great, um, and then so around the time 522 BCE, a Magnus by the name of uh, Gaumata claimed to be Bardiya, son of predecessor King Cyrus II the Great, and usurped the royal power, da da da. And so there's a little more information further down. So these Magi uh, were basically uh, part of a fire cult. So the fire cult of the Magi was widespread in Cappadocia, and their fire altars were located in sacred places inside enclosures where the Magi kept the fire burning forever. And I know there's like these flames all over the earth that have been set up, the, um, the never-ending flame. And so that, to me, is a, is a symbol of the Magi. According to the statements of some of them, the Magi were disciples and followers of Zoroaster. The Magi were not representatives of any particular religion, but technical experts, professional priests who served the cult of any Iranian gods for pay. So they did this for money. According to his opinion, the Magi adopted Zoroastrianism only at the end of the 4th century BCE and proclaimed Zoroaster to be their teacher. Um, and this, this writer here assumed that the terms Magus was the ethnicon and did not designate a caste or profession. According to him, the Magi supplies, supplied the Medes with court priests as early as at least under the last Median king, who was under some influence of the teachings of Zoroaster. So these people supplied religious uh, you know, services for uh, these Iranian gods, these people who worshipped Iranian gods. And, you know, this is just kind of hailing to the whole money aspect and the, you know, what God do you serve, you know? Uh, you can only serve the true God. You cannot serve both God and money. And I think there's overlap here. But these people did turn up to the birth of Jesus with very expensive gifts. And, you know, it just causes us to wonder, you know, what their true intentions were with that were they realizing that this was a new kingdom coming into play and they wanted to bring gifts so that they could also be part of this new um, rulership as they, you know, as they obviously realized it was important from an astrological point of view. Some of you will have seen this before. This is a sketch uh, I have that I just collected off of Pinterest. This is not mine. But it's also very interesting because it, it draws out technically the, the, the movement of the celestial realm. So the firmament and all of the gates and all of the paths of every celestial body in the firmament. And I have more uh, images here to share. But I wanted to initially just talk about this because I think the mechanics of it are very interesting. So the, the moon has gates, as you can see here. Uh, there's six here, uh, actually eight, sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So in the middle we have some here too. And what this is um, showing us is that the moon goes through gates in its cycle, as does the sun, 
and the Bible talks about the sun traveling you know running like an athlete and going to its tent and coming out again and so these are not unbiblical concepts even though it is the book of it, it is one Enoch I do not recommend reading the other Enoch books but one Enoch does align very well with scripture as far as I am aware and it does not contradict uh, anything that we actually know to be true already in the canon of scripture and so that's something that obviously investigate that for yourselves but this diagram or these diagrams are very good because they they sort of hypothesize what the gates might look like what the wheels would look like and so the wheel of the sky and the wheels within wheels and the turning and the mechanisms that I'm sure it's much more <laughs> complex than this but this does a good job of drawing out the various um, mechanics that are going on in the sky and it does have a very complex nature to it this is not very you know accurate because I you know they've kind of taken the this is from the creator's calendar I think and they've taken this kind of uh, heliocentric model but what I did want to show is that the movement of the constellations through the various stages of the year and through the different quadrants is what gives us our seasons uh, and so the the moon travels the sun travels and then the constellations also travel the sun is not the center and that's what's wrong with this diagram here is that the sun is not the the center the earth is the center and the way that the but the sky moves around us you see and so I think from a position of reading these labels here and kind of understanding the different movements of all of these constellations is very helpful and so I want to um, I want to talk about gates and portals so when we're talking about the East Gate and you know, in just generally speaking, the east, we have this, we have to understand that the mechanism of the sky, the timepiece under which we live, has these portals built into it. And that is how the moon actually changes its shape. This is how the illumination of the moon is controlled and how the the, the stars actually change their shape. So they go through these, these, these shifts, you see, and so we have six portals in each annual cycle and you can see that as they move around count, uh, uh, clockwise that there are these portals here. And so that's just a good visual to kind of start with. And we also have the equinox, the vernal equinox, the summer solstice, autumn equinox and summer sol and winter solstice that happen within the same seasonal calendar under which we live and the calendar being 364 days and we have your three for each season and you know this this kind of uh, cycle that really keeps us moving through and I just want to mention as well that there are very many different calendars and even still there are different calendars that do not match up in terms of what year it is uh, even if you go to your Outlook calendar, if you use Microsoft Outlook, you can change your calendar to reflect completely different calculations. Uh, so there's, I, I don't have them off the top of my head, but there's different calendars that around the world you could still use in your calendar uh, to tell you it's a different year. Uh, so it's very interesting, but we have the 364 day Ethiopic calendar and that's more of an ancient lunar solar calendar and then we have uh, here three 30 day months and one archangel or year bearer day uh, the Mayan and Egyptian versions and then the Jewish versions uh, uses a 49 year or 50 year Jubilee calendar cycle with seven year weeks so this is a this is just a little depiction of again that that seasonal one and I want to talk about the star, the pole star. I'm starting to think, and this is just my pondering, so don't take me for having 
worked all of this out. This is a lot of information for any of us and we all have jobs, we all have other things that are going on in our lives. So just a pondering, but I sometimes wonder if the star at the pole is the same star that arrived when, or that was heralding the coming of Jesus Christ. And on that note, I want to talk about, again, just jump back over to the topic of the East. And the reason I bring in the East here is because the gate of the garden, the Eastern gate of the garden was protected. And the, the basic understanding of the East in relationship to Jesus, so his birth, uh, these people were from the East, which is to me a location. And it is also a, um, an indication of where Jesus was because when they say, we saw your star in the East, that just makes me wonder whether the star actually was in the East, as they say. And I know they, are, they lived in the East, they were from the East, but they saw the star in the East. And so again, this just makes me wonder if the star they were traveling toward was also sort of further east than they were already, if that makes sense. Just a hypothesis, I'm not saying it's true, I could be wrong. But if we go to the, and I know Strong's concordance can be a little bit sketchy, so don't obviously, you know, we have, we only have this to work with. We don't know Greek and Hebrew and all of these, so I just want to use this for now. Uh, but the word east in the KJV uh, is actually defined as the front, uh, so eastward, aforetime, ancient time. So we're talking about time now. How does that, where does that come into it? How does time and the front and this sort of positioning of the east become time relevant, okay? And we'll see that as we start talking about the meridian, the international date line which separates the East from the West. So this is where it comes into importance. Uh, so it's, it's defined as the front. And so if your door is at the front of your house and that is the East, the East gate, then it would make sense that it is at the, the front of things. And so aforetime, ancient time, and then before on the East side, eastward, eternal, everlasting, forward, and old past. And then in the Brown Driver Briggs Dictionary Hebrew Lexicon, it defines it as the front, again, the beginning, and which is before, so ancient times, toward the east, form of old, earliest time, mount of the east. So we're talking time. So here we're actually um, realizing that there's a direct link between the definition of east and the time. And so I think that's really important to, to talk about our next uh, conversations. But again, just the reason why I say that when Jesus was born, his star was seen in the East and the Magi were from the East. Something else that just I want to draw attention to is even the, the, the heathens and the pagans, they do this thing where they recognize certain solstices and things like that. And I, I truly believe that's because whether they realize it or not, but they are harnessing the uh, their ast astrological understandings to communicate, I believe, with uh, celestial or worship celestial bodies. And in this case, the sun is the summer solstice, uh, the, the one that they recognize at that time. And when they're doing this, they're actually looking to the east. And I spoke about this in another video where the reason uh, the temple the east gate was where you would come in is because the sun would be behind you. So when God is to be worshipped, the sun was not to be worshipped, you see. So God puts himself in direct opposition to the rising of the sun because when the sun shines through the gate into the temple, it is shining into his, uh, his holy of holies. And so the sun shines in. So the glory is not on the sun. The glory is on God. And so when we face, you know, these sort of sunrise uh, events, if you will, or these kind of solstice-based worship events, I would encourage you not to do them. 
because the sun exists to glorify God just as all creation does. And, you know, the, the reason that the fallen celestial bodies uh, were were condemned was because they fell from their heavenly estate. They did, they decided to leave their first estate and that was their choice. And so when, when nature turns against God, that is, you know, that's rebellion, including us when we choose not to follow God. So the reason we do not, you know, we don't do these pagan practices is because they, they worship the creation instead of the creator. Okay. That's what it's all about. But what they are doing as well is they are harnessing this understanding of astrology to uh, take the power from this celestial event. And I think that's why the eclipses are also uh, very key to the pagans. Many of you will recognize this map, which is the Gleason's Flat Earth map. And so I don't have to explain too much about this. However, I want to draw your attention to a part of it that many of us never noticed before. I certainly didn't until I started really looking closely. And that was this, uh, this diagram at the top of the map. And what I notice here is that it has three stars. I don't know if there's a west star, but this one has an S. This one has an E and this one has an N. And I'm wondering if that means that this one in the middle is the star, the Eastern star that we would consider to be uh, that kind of one at the top. Uh, we know that, you know, the, the location of the East and the star that heralded Jesus coming are very intertwined in terms of uh, biblical references and so that's I just wanted to draw your attention to that because I I don't know about these three stars and it kind of when you look at the pre the full map itself you'll see that there is kind of this uh, pyramid here or triangle at the top of it and so something you might want to investigate a little bit more yourself we're going to call it the North Star. So the North Star, we believe, is actually Polaris, which is in the middle, and Polaris indicates that it is actually above the North Pole. In my understanding, there are there's a geographical North Pole, which you know is in like the center of the geography, and you'll see on the Mercator map. There's an island above Siberia. I talk about this a lot because it does seem to not really resonate or, or it doesn't seem to uh, it doesn't align with the way that we think in modern times regarding the North Pole we've been told there's one North Pole and I just want to show you that there is a geographical North and I believe that is where the kingdom the center of the kingdom of God is here on earth and I also want to say that there is a magnetic pole, which is not the center. And I'm not saying that our compasses don't point to Jesus or don't point to the north, geographical north. I'm just saying that there are two. There's a magnetic pole, which is over above Siberia. I do not think it's moving. I think it's always been there, but where people are a climate, you know, sort of, positioning themselves on earth I think affects which way it's pointing and it won't always necessarily that magnetism won't necessarily always be in the same location I don't think it's moving just to put my thoughts out there on that um, and I don't believe science anyway <laughs> so uh, I don't believe what they tell us and so the other thing is that we looked at this also in the River Jordan video and this is a another flat earth depiction of earth and where south is actually is all around the outside and therefore the opposite of the south is the north which is the inside and so when we talk about quadrants of the earth i think it's not exactly uh, in a pie shape i don't think they're they're cut up into a pie i think east and west are either side of the meridian 
and I think that the south is around the outside and the north is on the inside and so directionally that's where everything is and that makes logical sense from a position of flat earth. One of my interests in this study has been the Bering Strait, which is, sits, is the sea that sits between Alaska and Russia. So many in the U.S. will call it the Pacific Northwest, but it's much higher up. And I've been talking in this series, at least, about the Strait Gate in the Bible that's mentioned. And we've looked at a lot of maps, so I don't want to just redo what I've done before. But I did find that Bethel which is a very interesting name for a place and I don't I notice there aren't too many mountains around this area and I think it's because the cataclysm that happened that caused uh, meltage and earthquakes and liquefaction came from above the strait uh, the Bering Strait in the above the Alaska uh, region and above Siberia and I'll, I'll talk about the cataclysm more in a different video, but initially I wanted to talk about some of the the north region and what people see in the sky, and this was just uh, something I found tagged with Bethel, Alaska on Facebook, and someone had taken a picture of this sort of distinct shape in the sky, which I find very interesting because the only way you could draw lines like that is with something that literally is redirecting the light in that shape and so I don't you know where the haze is at the bottom of that you know the, the, the bluish haze at the bottom and then there's a consistent light across the entire horizon except for where these lines are lines of light and uh, I also find it very interesting that this place is called Bethel. And they've even put a little cross there, which is kind of neat. But when we're talking about gates and portals, I just wonder if this is how it is visibly portrayed to us in creation at times when those particular features of the firmament would be most uh, not ex I don't want to say accessible because I, I don't know if that's true but I, I want to say that I wonder if certain times of day or certain seasons or the change of a certain you know month uh, would be what would kind of initiate that that visible shape in the sky and here's another picture from Bethel, Alaska, and it does look like it has been enhanced, so I don't want to uh, assume too much about that one, but it looks as though the closer you go to that area, the more up and down and more vibrant the Aurora Borealis is, and it seems to go straight up and down like that. And the number of churches in this region as well. So Russia, what Russia sold Alaska to the USA in the 1800s, and there's a lot of Russian, old Russian churches there. And this is Bethel in Alaska. Again, it's not a very mountainous region. I expected it to be more mountainous, but it's more coastal, so it's a little bit flatter and yeah but they get a lot of this in the sky there. So position wise and you know in relationship to where you know might be I believe well I, I think it is there is the the camp of the saints and possibly the new Jerusalem has has descended already so it doesn't surprise me that these lights would be very visible in this location just by the proximity. So the reason why the the solstices are important and why I think there are certain times of year that 
we don't want to do what the pagans do, but there are certain times of year where I do think that the fallen ones knew that the portals were open and this is how they would engage with humanity. And so we must be uh, cautious when we're talking about these things, but as the Book of Enoch describes the entire portal system and the, the way that it, it works within God's cycle of things, it seems that the way that the sun moves through certain areas is key to understanding how this, uh, this portal system actually works. And so when it gets to, for example, the zenith of its cycle around the earth, we're not going around the sun, remember, the, earth, we're, the sun is going around the earth, and so it'll be going through these various stages and portals and gates, and so these are, these are locations. Now the one that I've been really interested in is the international date line, and the reason for that is because that is where we have been dictated that our time begins and ends and so looking at the description of the the east that is the beginning and so therefore that is where they determine that the sun is actually rising from however i'm not too sure that's true a hundred percent because for one thing they bend the line to go between alaska and russia and so we'll look at that, but they also um, they also moved the the meridian, and uh, it goes through Greenwich now, which is in England, and it also goes through the Alaska between Alaska and Russia. I mentioned that the international date line has been changed. Uh, sorry, the prime meridian has moved, and so I want to read this to you just to give you some backup. Uh, to what I've just said. So the international date line is an imaginary line that runs roughly, that roughly follows the 180 degree line of longitude and passes through the Pacific Ocean. However, this line is not straight and strays from the 180 degree meridian at certain points. In some places it appears as a zigzag, deviating to the meridians east or west. The deviations enable places of some economic and political affiliations to share the same date or time. Otherwise, if the IDL were a straight line, it would divide certain land masses into two parts with different, two different dates on the same day. And uh, I don't think God created it to be that way. So the way that we are understanding time has been corrupted in these ways. This is one of the ways. And uh, it basically it should go through this area here called Russia in Russia called the Chukchi Peninsula and it should actually go directly across Wrangell Island which is the uh, Polis Magnetis which is the magnetic pole and that's where the original line goes through but they've broken it and it goes around and it goes between Russia and America and uh, so that is just something that happened so this happened in 1884 and the International Meridian Conference basically uh, established the International Date Line as an imaginary line running uh, along the 180 degree meridian and the conference was attended by 26 nations so again this very collaborative event so that they could establish what the time is on earth for their own benefit for their own profit and so they settled on the 180 longitude because it runs through an open ocean and who knows really why they chose that why would they choose it to go through an open ocean very odd but that's what happened and if we look down here you can just see what that looks like and i believe god would have made that into a straight line but because of the way they want to control and and take power over the earth they do these things so that Russia's on that side, America's on that side, and you know, essentially they can control this, they can jointly control this area. So it seems to be to me that this area very unguarded on either side. Let's you know, let's just put that out there. Uh, you know, the fishermen and the uh, indigenous people live in that area, and there's you know, tourists, I guess I guess to a certain extent. But this isn't uh, a highly protected area, 
and therefore when we talk about you know Russia being this big baddie on the world stage it's it's kind of laughable because you realize that they share a very close border there it's it's extremely close and we'll look at that a little bit more in a minute but uh, Greenwich is the prime meridian, meridian now so that is where we take our zero time from uh, to to start the clock if you will the Bering Strait is located between the Pacific Ocean and the Arctic Ocean represents the border between Russia and the United States the eastern mo most points of Asia and Russia are located at the Bering Strait so east okay so this is why I'm talking about the prime meridian because when we talk about the location of the east and where the sun rises, this is where the position of all of this took place. And I think when it was running through the Russian side, you would have had actually a portion of the west on that top most point. And uh, I do have some depictions of that, but I've covered that in other videos. And what's interesting is in that topmost point where that would have been originally the west side of the, the, the international date line, um, on the west side of there is where we see uh, very interesting labels on the maps and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But originally the, the meridian went through this area of Russia called Pulvoko, Polkovo, sorry, and it was originally the, the location. What I also find interesting is that the international date line runs through the Diomede Islands. So there's two tiny little islands that sit right in the Bering Strait, right between Alaska and Russia. So one of the islands belongs to Russia, one of the islands belongs to America. And there's this intentional moving of the line to go straight through these two little islands. And we'll look at that again in a minute. And there is a meridian and it's called the Naval Observatory Meridian, the new Naval Observatory Meridian. And it runs through the clock room of the Naval Observatory, which is situated about 2.3 miles northwest of the White House in Washington. And so that's just something else to be uh, aware of. So the Meridian is found along the 77 degrees, three minutes, 56.7 seconds east longitude. So that's something to just be aware of as we talk about time and as it relates to the east and as it relates to the north and we will close in on some ideas here as well. And this is just a picture of where the Polvoko, Polkovo Observatory was in Russia, not that that means anything to many people here. but. Uh, what I wanted to say about this was I wanted to draw attention to the fact that observatories are somewhat um, like temples. So if you're a pagan and you worship the sun and you worship the celestial bodies, observatories are those places where you observe the gods that you worship. Okay, so these are very, uh, I would call them very occultic facilities and they are used in that way. I think that's why they actually have them in such prominence. There's one in my city, which is right up on a hill, and if you're there, you would probably see the sunrise every morning from that position. And who knows what they do there? It's a government facility, so <laughs> I can't really say what they do in those places because you have to have special permission to go there. Now, I took this little uh, screen recording and it really just talks about meridian what does meridian mean and so if we look back at the 14th century uh, word anti meridian and it means noonday from old french or midday meridian is the noon time midday and directly from the latin meridianus meridianus is of midday or noon southerly to the south from merids south and noon and I'll just play this a little bit. So Anta Meridian. Anta Meridian is what we call AM. 
so the morning and we can see here that for cartography the meridian obviously they're using heliocentric words here sphere passing through the poles but actually uh, it divides east and west is how I understand it and it's at the highest point of development or fullest power so isn't that interesting language when we talk about the locations of where Jesus might be in relation to the east and the west the east gate which is you know where the entrance of Eden is and where this point of highest development or fullest power would be uh, positioned and it's considered to be a kind of a junction so a meridian could also be a junction where two things uh, two two look uh, directions come together and again that that falls in line with the east and west uh, so anti meridian being the morning and that was 1776 which is quite an interesting year for that to have been decided uh, or at least going forward we would use these words am or these acronyms am And Anno Monday is what they they want to label as year of the 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 world. So AM could be used in that respect as well in old chronologies. And so that that just kind of aligns a few concepts for us. So we have uh, the sky, you know, the star in the east. We have the locations of in relationship to the north area of Siberia being a position of activity, a cataclysm, we have the gates being positioned there, uh, the east of Eden I should say, so in the, the east gate of Eden is where the cherubim was located and so just tying some of these things in together and then also the time. So the, the, the time actually starts where east meets west and where the sun is considered to be rising and how we as Christians and believers in God, uh, followers of the Almighty God, the creator of all things, we do not look to the east, we don't look to the sun, we look to God, we look to uh, Him as our ruler, and, and so the sun is there to glorify Him, not the other way around. We don't look to the sun itself, we don't worship the creation. So I want to show you in the book of Esdras where I've located uh, from another video I actually covered this as well but I just want to go back to this because I think it helps us position ourselves in terms of um, the words that have been written in prophecy as well as locations on the earth and I also suspect that some of this has been hidden from us I use that word a lot but there has been a lot hidden from us we live in a time of great deception and so this verse in 2nd Ezra 13 chap uh, chapter 13 verse 45 talks about the ways uh, so here it goes and they entered into Euphrates by the narrow places of the river and for the most high that showed signs for them and held still the flood till they were passed over for that for through that country there was a great way to go namely of a year and a half and the same region is called Arzareth so we're linking together uh, an area Euphrates, narrow places of the river, and then we also know that in our understanding of what has happened, and I believe there was a cataclysm that happened that came down from the north, that I, I think it was, it could have been this time where the veil was placed over the holy city, something to that effect, but I, there was a cataclysm that shook the earth, uh, caused untold uh, consequences to the earth change the shape of things and so when we start looking at this I want to just start drawing out this but this Arzareth I talked about in a previous video and if you go down I, I located a few others like um, so this is actually up in northern Tartaria Siberia current day Siberia and we I located and through scripture uh, talked about um, Tabor 
here, so Mount Tabor, Danarum, and Naphtali, but also here is Arzareth. Okay, Arzareth is here, and this is Siberia, and this is the part that's on the western side of the International Dateline, and it's on the Strait of Anyan, which is actually current day Bering Strait. So they changed the name of this, this strait to, to reflect uh, a person that they sent over there called Bering. And so something you'll see there, though, is that the International Dateline or the meridian actually cuts through this area and so if we're talking about east and west, east is actually going through Siberia and the western side of that would be also Siberia but it would be in the west so it would be considered western where this side would be eastern and uh, you know not to spell it out too blatantly but I, I believe that's a very uh, positive indication of where things are located in in relationship to the north because the north is where the uh, the heavenly Jerusalem would have come down or will come down it could be there already and it's just positioned uh, this is pointing directly to it and then we have this narrow area here so when we look at the verse prior to 45 so we look at 43, these are the people that are coming back to the kingdom. This is like a migration story and it's talking about, uh, you know, like rebuilding and and sort of the people coming away from the land of their captivity. And so it talks about for that, the country there was, uh, sorry, and they entered into Euphrates by the narrow places of the river. And I, I often am wondering whether this was a kind of river or considered to be a kind of river because it was so close together and you know we learn as well that <clears throat> something I've talked about as well is that the great sea and sort of these coastal descriptions are not reflected in the little maps on the back in the back of the Bible and that it's more likely that in my mind these are located in this region here Notably, there is no little island or islands in between this area, so just bear that in mind. And this being the Mercator map, so here is the Strait of Anyan, it's labeled there as well. And it comes right up into this rivered area of the north region. This is also right below the Strait of Anyan, and this is China. I found it very interesting to look at this, because when you look at it, the wall goes all the way around China. Well, these mountains are included in this kind of wall that goes around it. But when you scan out into this ocean here, which is the Atlantic or the Bering Sea, we see this curious image of a crucifixion. And it even says on there, Christians, Christianos. And it actually shows them pushing a spear into the side there. Just something to call out on this particular map. I also want to talk about the caribou because the caribou are a northerly animal that not only are named caribou, but they are also called reindeer. And that's something that I found in investigating this area that, and the entire north, they play a role in the northern region, not just through myth, but also through uh, current day science. Uh, people are very interested in reindeer. And then we have the, the kind of Santa northern story that plays into that as well. 
but I also wanted to just draw us back to Matthew 7 14 straight is the gate and narrow is the way and we went through the word study of that last time so I won't continue doing that but here are the two little islands that sit in between Alaska you can't see them because I wanted to focus on a couple of things in this image Whoops. in this image so we have Alaska on the right side of the image, we have Siberia on the left, and then we have these two little islands that now sit between them. But I thought this was a very interesting picture because it shows the flow of presumably ice, ocean ice, that is coming through this area. And it just shows you how narrow it is, right? Because it's like it's being funneled through this area. So when we talk about they entered into Euphrates by the narrow places of the river and the Most High then showed signs for them and held still the flood till they were passed over. And so I find that image just very, it kind of speaks to that, that flow of the water coming from the north, pushing through this area to the south, to the, to the sea that's beyond. And, uh, I think there's some I think there's some probability there for this being the region that much of the Bible could have actually taken place in. And you know, it's it's approximation to the north, which is if Jerusalem was there, if it the old Jerusalem was there and then the new Jerusalem came down, that would be, you know, that we have this sea in the middle and this dark area that sits above Siberia, above Alaska, above this strait, and you know that would that would be very convincing to me that that would be the location of the New Jerusalem. And when I look on Google Maps, it even says the word "strait" just as used in Scripture. Uh, the word "strait," S-T-R-I-A-T. And the other thing it uses is narrow. Well, there's all these straits here, but this one actually uses the word narrow and it uses the word gateway. So straight, narrow gate. <laughs> I have to draw that one out again. So they've, they've moved the international border and dateline to go through these two little islands and you'll see how little they are and they're very close together. And so when we're talking about the closeness of Russia and America, this is how close they are. And this is an actual uh, real photograph of what they look like. And I, I find this the, the photographic images of these to be very interesting as well because they look like they're not natural. They don't look like natural things. And when we, you know, islands, and when we go back to old maps they're not actually there so it makes me wonder if these are man-made and if there was at some point I'm not saying nefariously or anything like that but if these two land masses were connected not by a natural land bridge but maybe by a, a building of either the millennial reign or something along those lines because if this area is important from a perspective of getting to the kingdom, the, uh, the city or the camp of the saints, and if these two were bringing people to this area, there may have been something here That, that sort of created a central point of meeting or collection or, you know, you would go here to go north. Because I don't think these islands actually look natural. And when you look at images of them, they, they look a little bit um, fabricated. And the other thing is they've, you know, they allow, uh, or, or not allow, <laughs> There are people that live here, and so these are now the homes of people. In other words, you can't just go there. You can't, you need special permission. You need um, 
what is your purpose for being here? And it's, you know, uh, I haven't looked into it myself. I've not looked to go there, but it does seem to me that these are there intentionally. And the reason that the international dateline was moved in between them was to control that area tightly by the two biggest powers in the world, Russia and America. So, you know, the reason America owns one side, Russia owns the other, is so that they can coordinate their efforts for whatever reason, but this does seem to be a very important area politically, economically, and probably historically. And they've named them Diomedes, which is uh, from the old myths of the old Greek myth. And uh, so, you know, they've kind of set, set their um, heathen belief systems into that as well. One of the other maps that I've looked at is this one, and it shows the Alaska area here, and the Strait of Anyan here, and this area is the Polis Magnetis here, and this points to the river system that goes into the north. And this REG, Anyan Regium, is actually a kingdom, so it denotes uh, a reign, R-E-I-G-N, reign, and this would be like the kingdom of Anyan. So when we, you know, when we start thinking about this area and what it would have been like back in these days, back in the time that these maps were drawn, things like that, uh, just think of it that there was kingdoms all over the earth. And we know that because of the old maps, they show us where those kingdoms were located and all the cities and all of the amazing um, areas of architecture and things like that. So I just like this perspective because it shows you how close the top of the Strait of Anyan is, or <laughs> it looks close, it's probably not that close, but it, it shows you that directionally through the Strait of Anyan, you, you basically end up going straight into this river system that comes out of the north region. And I just, this top, uh, area, this label at the top right, I put through Google Translate and it says the ocean, often breaking in between these islands, forms four seas, by which it is carried incessantly to the north and there it is absorbed with great force. And one of the things you find when you start going into these areas is you just find through ResearchGate, you just find tons and tons and tons of scientific research. So there's a lot of money and effort and appearance going into their activity at the north as being a scientific matter. And they'll be like, oh, you know, we picked up all this sand off the bottom of the ocean and it is, you know, then they're breaking down all these really boring facts about, you know, the, the kind of water and the kind of sand and, and plankton and all of these things when really what a cover that is, right, for the what's actually going on up there. Here, <laughs> I got this picture because I was like, you can just see the firmament right there. Uh, but again, this is the Explore the North, and this is off the NOAA, um, NOAA site. And so they, they, number one, they want you to see it in this way, that it's just constantly covered in ice. Makes it very inhospitable, not somewhere it makes you want to actually go. And so it sets your mind kind of against this, uh, the idea of even going there. It looks like there's nothing there. Why would anyone want to go there? And so you need this massive boat to even get through the ice. And uh, yeah, the people I'm sure are paid very high to be there. So I want to talk a little bit about migration because one of the things I found when studying the Wrangell Island specifically, which is the Magnetis Polis above Siberia, is that they had placed uh, herds in the 1950s they had placed herds of reindeer on the island and I was like that's weird it is a little bit odd but actually when you consider that they took these reindeer also named caribou out of their natural habitat in which they they actually are the I think they're one of the biggest migrations of species uh, on an annual kind of migration pattern of anything in the world and I think salmon are another one that do this as well, but the, the reindeer caribou do a massive migration. And you can see here, it kind of goes all the way down into the Pacific Northwest, maybe that's 
kind of the Midwest, I'm not too sure, that looks like Washington State to me, but it goes all the way up to the border of Alaska, and I think they even go up into Alaska, but they're, the area that they go to in the summer is like in this region here, and did you know that reindeer are very good swimmers, actually? Uh, they do a lot of swimming, and they cross a lot of bodies of water. So I was interested to find out that they placed a herd of, like a rather large herd of reindeer on Wrangell Island, which is above Siberia, and that is the one where the North, uh, sorry, the International Dateline, the Meridian, actually runs right through naturally. And so it made me wonder, are they studying where do these, maybe the, maybe the reindeer actually go into the water and they go across into the lands of the north? Maybe they get there somehow, and maybe that was a big mystery to them. We know that they use the reindeer in the Santa stories to show that they fly into the north. There's, you know, this is a big mystery to me, but I just wanted to call out that this migration has been studied, I think, for the purpose of really getting into that north region. And I think that there is a blockage in the way, but they're trying to figure out how do, maybe how do natural species migrate there and back? Maybe something like that, probably even fish. So a lot of these scientific research uh, companies up there are probably studying how these, you know, species actually get in and out. It might be something like they can do it, but we can't, right? So who knows what's going on I'm hypothesizing I'm just pondering things but I'm sharing my thoughts with you because maybe there's something of value in here that we can use and this is the famous Chilkoot Pass which is in um, I think it's shared actually between on the border between Canada and Alaska so the border that goes uh, between the two is where the Chilkoot Pass goes and the official narrative says that it was a gold uh, gold rush and so people were doing this to find gold and you can see it kind of spans across this region here between Alaska and the Yukon and in particular there's this area which interestingly coincides with the migration of the the caribou reindeer right up in that same area so it's like the middle point of the border between the Arctic Ocean and this uh, water below Alaska and, and the Yukon here. And it is like kind of a migration. You know, if we take away the gold rush aspect of it, this, is, this looks like a migration to me. And they're going at, in this winter time. I don't know exactly what time of year they actually went and did this, but it looks like a very important journey that these people were taking. And I would suggest that, and I, I've said this before, and I know other people have too, that this is more of a migratory event as opposed to something driven by gold. And they, you know, a very tough journey, but if you consider that maybe there was closing time, maybe there was a time period that was closing that and there's a reason why we're not doing this anymore uh, but who knows what was actually uh, the result of this migration and here we can see there were a number of migration patterns maybe they had actually stopped running the trains to a certain area and the only way to get there was to hike there that's possible as well and so we had you know all these routes from different points that you would obviously travel to and then you would have to journey from those areas probably on your own expense and did you know that the Trump family were involved in the original gold rush of the Klondike the so-called gold rush and so here it says it's a very long way from the Yukon to any of Donald Trump's glittering properties scattered across the major cities of the world but that abandoned town site at the end of the Chilkoot Trail is where the Trump Empire was born there is not much left of Bennett Town 
today, just as the old wooden church high up on the blue water of Lake Bennett and the empty mountains and sky all around. In summer, the White Pass and Yukon route train. Its engine painted bright green and yellow still chugs through the space where the tent city used to be. In winter, the whole area is quiet, layered in snow. And just so, just so you have that idea, but I do find it interesting that Donald Trump also wanted to buy Greenland. So, you know, there's just a correlation there between Trump and Trump. Trump great-grandfather and Trump today. And there have been proposals actually put in to buy Greenland. So this whole northern region, if you look at this map, they actually wanted to own the north, which is very telling, isn't it? And I don't think they can own Canada because Canada is owned by the royals of England. Finally, I just want to read through some of the, the book that John Bunyan wrote uh, called Solomon's Temple Spiritualized, also called Gospel Light. And he does make some great points and he always sort of quotes scripture or references the scripture that he's using in that way. He was a preacher and so I believe that his, uh, his understandings of things are very special and I, I really appreciate them. So he's talking about the the temple of God and if you remember the the layout of the temple or if you're aware of the layout of the temple there was these bronze oxen that were placed in the uh, the temple forefront so I think under the brass bowl what was called the sea and so and observe just as the oxen were placed looking at in the temple every way so from all directions so they would have been looking you know from all all directions even so stand open the gates of the new Jerusalem to receive those that by their doctrine should be brought into it and they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God revelation 21 13 and 14 and Luke 13 29 and he says here uh, so he's talking again about the temple of God so in two parts so the first house namely that which we have been speaking of which was a type of church militant and the place most holy a type of the church triumphant i say of the church triumphant as it is now so then the house standing of these two parts was a shadow of the church both in heaven and earth and for that they are joined together by one and the same foundation it was to show that they above and we below are yet one and the self-same house of God. Hence, they and we are together. And are called the whole family in heaven and earth, as in Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. And hence it is said again that we who believe on earth are come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to the spirits of just men uh, made perfect, and to God, the judge of all, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better than things than that of Abel. Hebrews 12, 22, 23 to 24. The difference then betwixt us and them is not that they are really two, but one body in Christ in diverse places. True, we are below stairs and they above they in their holy day and we in our working day close they in harbor but we in the storm they are at rest and we in the wilderness they singing as crowned with joy we crying as crowned with thorns but i say we are all of one house one family and are all children of one one father this therefore we must not forget lest we debase ourselves of much of that which otherwise, while here, we have a right unto. Let us therefore, I say, remember that the temple of God is but one, though divided, as one may say, into kitchen and hall, above stairs and below, or holy and most holy place, for it stands upon the same foundation and is called but one, the temple of God, which is built upon our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
I added that. I told you before that none of old could go into the most holy, but by the holy place, even by the veil that made the partition between Exodus 26, 33, Leviticus 16, 2, 12, 15, and Hebrews 9, 7, and 8, chapter 10 and 19. Wherefore they are deceived that think to go into the holiest, which is heaven, when they die, who yet abandon and hate the holy place while they live. Nay, the way into the holiest is through the holy place, the way into heaven is through the church on earth, for that Christ is there by his word to be received by faith. Therefore he can by us in person be received in the beatification, beatifical vision. The church on earth is as the house of the women spoken of in the book of Esther, where we must be dieted, perfumed, and made fit to go into the bridegroom's chamber. Bridegroom's chamber, Or as Paul says, made meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And I think that's Ephesians 2 and Colossians 1.12. And here it talks about the doors. And so besides the veil, there's a door, the inner. And so it says here, these doors were a type of the gate of heaven. So he's talking about the temple, but he's saying it's a type of gate of heaven, even of that which lets into the eternal mansion house that is beyond the veil. I told you before that the veil was a type of the visible heavens, which God has spread out as a curtain and through which Christ, when he has ascended to the right hand of the Father. Now beyond this veil, as I said, I find a door, a gate opening with two leaves as a four we found at the door of the outward temple. These are they which the psalmist calls to when he faith, lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, the everlasting doors. Uh, and so it says here, be a type of the precious ones of God who shall be counted worthy of his kingdom when one of the uprightness of their hearts, the one of the uprightness of their hearts, the other of the good favor of their lives, the upright shall dwell in thy presence and to him that ordereth his conversation aright, I will show the salvation of God. And that's Psalm, I can't work out what number that is there, 13 and then Psalm 1. Thus, sweet in earth, sweet in heaven, and he that yields the fruits of the gospel here shall find it for himself and his eternal comfort at the gates of glory. So one last thing I want to talk about is the dew line. Uh, so this is the detect early warning uh, system that they set in place a long time ago using the USSR as their um, enemy, so-called enemy and uh, you know to protect the United States and Canada and they've set up this whole system of um, basically just keeping an eye on everything that's going on in these areas and you know I think the only reason that I can think of that they would actually do this considering they already have this kind of uh, connection at the Bering Strait is that uh, the only reason that they would really do this is to keep an eye on what's going on at the north because for reasons unknown to us but you know God knows why there appears to be a veil there and I'm sure that is for end times to be fulfilled in the way that he has planned for it to be and all of these things are by his design but it does seem that they're very nervous about this what God is planning because if you're on the wrong side of what God is doing, then you're not going to end up very well. And this is an image from 1954 in a newspaper, and it shows you all of these early warning sort of, um, and even these dots here are all of the locations that they've set up their, their radars basically to track the activity of the north and so-called uh, against the Russians. And so this is a depiction of, this will be my last kind of image and then I just want to read through some something, but this is the Pilgrim's Progress and the various challenges that he went through to find the city, the celestial city, and around which is this river. 
And, you know, when we look at the Mercator map, for example, uh, many of us have been looking at that quite a lot lately, it almost depicts a very similar structure to that. And so this river going around the celestial city, and I've read passages from the Pilgrim's Progress in the past where he goes up, so that straight gate sort of um, effect, and also, you know, the when he gets there he has to shed his old flesh behind him and it gets left in the river and then he comes to the other side and he meets you know his uh, his judgment so that's kind of the process i think there's been john bunyan did this so well you know he talks about this decision of of christian to leave the city of destruction which is over here and he kind of goes on this winding journey which takes him through many challenges and all of the challenges that we experience in reality and in our daily lives especially as christians you know the enemy is always hounding us in all these different ways whether it be through vanity or whether it be through direct assault of the the devil and uh, so he meets all of these challenges along the way but along the way he also finds encouragement through his friends and through you know other christians who are walking the same path as him and they're able to encourage each other and you know despite the efforts of the enemy to knock him off his course and basically make him give up and go back and even his family you know people that were not going with him and they were calling him crazy these kinds of uh challenges were there to when he finally got to where he he knew the heavenly Jerusalem was the celestial city he came to something called a wicked gate and that is going to be a topic of a future video I didn't have time to cover it in this one but I do hope that you'll watch that the wicked gate is a very interesting um, concept it's obviously not the gate to heaven or to the uh, to the the heavenly city or to the uh, camp of the saints but it is um, it is a gate nonetheless, and it is part of our journey as we go on this sort of uh, journey of discovery, which I believe is very important for us as believers in this little season. I'm going to look at Matthew really quickly here. Matthew 7, and I want to step through this chronologically because I think it's purposeful. When we look at Matthew 7, and just ignoring, ignoring these labels here because those aren't really in the Bible, but Matthew 7, verse 7, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. And then down to verse 13, which comes sort of after that part, it says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And I feel like we're on this journey of finding this gate, but right before that it tells us to ask, seek and knock and we will and we will be given those things that we ask for that we seek for and then knocking the door will be open to us that seems like quite appropriate for this conversation and finally I want to just review what we've talked about so far so we have actually talked about uh, the moon and how the moon fully illuminated actually gives us that calendar in God's cycle on the firmament which he has established so the moon to rule the night the sun to rule the day and the stars for the seasons and that is the perfect clock that God gave us the perfect calendar and clock all mixed into one and that the corruptions that we've seen have actually been changing what we understand about those such as the new moon being a, a dark face rather than the illuminated face of the moon and uh, so we looked at some of the calendar you know correlations to that including the Pasha the Passover and the start of the new year which is at the same time so around the time Jesus died and the Passover and uh, and then we also talked about the direction of the east and the east being that not just a location but it is a, it is a 
it has a direct correlation to the garden and the gate is where the to the garden or the entrance to the garden is where the cherubim was placed so that no nobody could come in there uh, obviously who had sinned and so the east is very specific it also relates to the temple so you enter in through the east gate of the temple to go in and worship god the sun being behind you as i as i mentioned and we also looked at some of the uh Correlations of the East as well to the international dateline, the meridian that goes right to the north, and they've curved it to go through the Bering Strait, so through that part of uh, water that is in between Alaska and Siberia. However, uh, we also talked about how that in itself is a corruption because the line actually goes through the western side of Siberia and it goes straight to the north. And so if we're talking about east and west, the dividing line of where the east is goes right through the, the west side of Siberia, not through the Georgia Strait, or the, not the Georgia Strait, the Bering Strait. Uh, we talked about the Magi, and we also talked about uh, the movement of the heavens and how the Magi had found Jesus by understanding that the stars uh, have a pattern and that they have a cycle and they understood that Jesus was a, um, a king, essentially. And um, so we, we also talked about the different portals and the gates and how there are times and seasons and how they work around this kind of clock calendar. Uh, calendar. And so the, the different celestial bodies are shifted around based on the their position within this this calendar and clock that God has created. Uh, we also talked about the the flat earth or the biblical cosmology and the dateline and the move of the dateline actually from where it was before and um, so that that international dateline I should say. And then we also looked at the Bering Strait and we talked about migrations and so the migrations of certain species of animal that go north in huge numbers like the most mass migrations you can imagine and we also saw people doing that and so you know this feeling of us being on some kind of migration it almost feels natural to some of us and uh, so the reindeer the caribou and then the north you know being that that they've created these fictions around the north being something like Santa Claus and, and all of this however uh, the true true meaning of the north is that that is where God is, that is where Zion is, the New Jerusalem, and we can just follow the Bible to understand what these things actually mean. So I just want to really read the last part of Revelation chapter 22, and I want to read verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. So we have an invitation. We are told to uh, enter by the straight gate. We are told to strive to enter by the straight gate. And uh, we are also told that when we knock, uh, he will answer. So there's an invitation there, and you know, we've often been told not to take Jesus words literally over the years but you know maybe these are indications that we are starting to realize that Jesus spoke not just in metaphor not just in these ways that are symbolic but knowing that the spiritual and the physical are overlapped we can trust the words of Jesus to lead us to him and I think especially now as we realize we're waking up in this time of deception Revelation 20 that we're, we're coming closer to a time where we are going to realize the culmination of all the things that God had taught us and told us to believe in Him. So I thank you very much, and I will talk to you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.